Shalom Avarim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and today we're going to have a discussion concerning Shabbat. We are going to hone in on a specific part of discussions that I always have with people about Shabbat, and that is the discussion or the area of discussion where people begin to tell me I don't have to celebrate Shabbat because my eternal rest is in the work of Yeshua. Yeshua did the work on the cross. He gave me eternal life, and so now I don't have to keep Shabbat. He's my eternal rest. I rest in him. I don't need a weekly rest. Or they will say, well, I can make it any day of the week, you know, because my eternal rest is in Yeshua. So I don't need to have a specific day that he tells me, but I can pick whatever I want because my rest is in Yeshua. He is grace and mercy. And so, um, yeah, I don't have to keep it. And so I will often ask them, well, what verses would you use to kind of help support that theology? What verses? would you use to support what you are saying? They will often take me to Hebrews chapter four and Hebrews chapter 10. And that is the areas where they will begin to interpret those verses in a manner that supports their theory. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and look at those verses today and see, does it hold any weight? Will their excuse for not celebrating Shabbat be legit? Is it, is it how we should interpret those verses? Mm -hmm. But before we begin, let's start out with the blessing of salvation. Let's give all praise and glory and honor to Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, our Lord, our King, for he's the only way to the Father, and he gives eternal life. So if you know this blessing, go ahead and join in with me. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanuet Derech HaYeshua, Bamashiach, Yeshua Baruch Hu. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has made the way of salvation through the Messiah Yeshua. Blessed be his name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and go to the book of Hebrews. Now we're going to start in chapter three because the verses that they give, the context actually starts in chapter three, verse seven. And so we're, that's where we're going to start. And then we'll read into chapter four, verses one through 11 is where we are heading. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and go to the book of Hebrews. All right. So here we are in Hebrews chapter three. We're going to be starting with verse seven. Now, it's very important to understand the context. The author of Hebrews uh, is highly likely, most scholars believe, is a Jewish author. Okay, Some say Paul, some say Apollos. Um, there are other people that have different um, people that they think wrote the book of Hebrews. And so um, most of them will say that this was probably for a Jewish synagogue. This was a Jewish audience. And I agree with all of that, that this was probably a sermon that was later written down in letter form and sent out to other synagogues, okay? And so this specific section here in chapter three, the author is talking about people's faith walk, okay? Encouraging them not to fall away, to walk faithful in Yeshua and not be like those who came out of Mitzrayim, who came out of Egypt, right? So um, Yahweh saved Israel by grace, Okay, no good works did they do to earn their salvation out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. But when they came to Sinai, they entered into a, what, marriage covenant. Okay, and there were Gentiles there. So that is our foreshadow of grafted in Gentiles, all one in the nation of Israel. They all said together after they heard the presentation of Moshe, he went up, you know, several times on the mountain. He came down, told them the words of Yahweh. And they all agreed together with one voice that they would do all that Yahweh commanded and said. And so you can see that in chapters 19 through 24. Chapter 24, we see the ratification of this covenant. It is a marriage covenant. And so this is a ketubah, a marriage contract. And part of it is Shabbat. Okay, We have the 10 words, the 10 davarim that were spoken of in chapter 20. And one of the big 10 is, of course, keeping Shabbat. And throughout um, the Torah, periodically, Yahweh will let them know. I think it's uh, chapter 31 of Exodus. He lets them know that it is a sign. Shabbat is a sign for you and to the world. Okay, It says it also in the book of Ezekiel, that it is a sign um, that Yahweh belongs to them. They belong to Yahweh. Okay, It's, a, it's part of the covenant sign. And it declares to the world that this people is separate unto Yahweh. He's sanctifying them. They are separate and holy unto, unto him. And so this is the sign. It's like a wedding ring. It's like wearing your wedding ring. Okay. 
That is what Shabbat is. It's like the wedding ring. When we get into the new covenant, the Brit Hadashah, we see in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 30 through 34, that it's, it's a new covenant. It's a Brit Hadashah, but it's made, of course, with Israel. Okay, no Gentile nation. So it's all the same as it was before. And then the Torah is now being supernaturally written on your heart. So nothing changes when it's written on your heart. This means you're going to have the even more ability to do all of the covenant uh, commandments. And there's nothing that has changed. The Shabbat is there. Okay. It's part of the big 10. It's part of the big 10, the utterances of Yahweh. And so these people here, whom the author is speaking of, they walked in rebelliousness. What did they do? They didn't obey the, the Sabbaths. They didn't obey many of the commandments that were part of the wedding contract. So they walked in stubbornness, they walked in disobedience, and now we're going to see what happens when you walk consistently in disobedience to your covenant relationship. Let's go ahead and begin. Verse 7, therefore, just as the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So they're relating it right back to the Sinai covenant, okay? The same type of walk you need to have needs to be, you need to be walking. Uh, very carefully because we don't want to be like those people who were in rebellion. It says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. There your fathers put me to the test. Though they saw my works for 40 years, therefore I was provoked by this generation. And I said, they always go astray in their heart. So it's always still been a heart thing, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, Yahweh was telling them, circumcise your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. So you can't just say, well, you know, I've got Yeshua in my heart. I've got this in my heart. It's always been a heart thing. They were going astray in their heart from the beginning, okay? And it says, and they have not known my ways. Well, wait a minute. He shared all his ways at Mount Sinai. What do you mean they have not known? They, they shouted out, we will do it all. Well, how do we know you know the ways of Yahweh? By what you do. Your faith walk includes walking in the commandments. It's part of the covenant. It's part of the promises you made. And so Yahweh will know whether you know his ways or not by how you walk. All right. So verse 11 says, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. They shall not enter my rest. Well, we know they didn't enter the promised land because of their sinfulness, right? The uh, golden calf incident, the um, lack of faith when the spies, the 12 spies came back and the 10 gave that bad report. It was said that if you were 20 and over, you will not enter into the promised land. Well, their rebelliousness Yahweh says here, they shall not enter my rest. What kind of rest is that? That is eternal rest in Yeshua. If you walked in faith in the, in the Tanakh before Yeshua came, people like Abraham and King David and Moshe and Joshua, we'll see them in heaven. Okay? The blood of Yeshua will cover their sins and what they did. They walked faithfully. So walking in faith is not a new covenant, old covenant. You know, There's not in contradiction of one another. There's not a different way. It's all the same type of faith walk. You put your faith and trust in Yahweh, your covenant relationship with him, and that's how you're judged, okay? These people are being judged and they are not found to be faithful. So they will not, what, enter my rest, okay? We're not gonna see them in the eternal rest of Yeshua. Take care, brothers, it says in verse 12, and sisters, that none of you has an evil heart of unbelief that falls away from the living God. He's speaking to believers, okay? They could, what, fall away. That's why he's warning them, okay? Everyone who came out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt, were saved. They were saved by grace. They were no longer slaves, okay? This is the picture, the foreshadow of salvation in Yeshua. And now you begin to walk this faith walk. You gotta be what? Faithful to the end. He who endures to the end shall be saved is what Yeshua says. And so these people were not faithful to the end, okay? Verse 13, but encourage one another day by day as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, okay? People can still become hardened. Even though you've been cleansed and washed by the blood, if you turn away, 
you can become hardened again. By what? The deceitfulness of sin, just like those that walked in the desert. For we have become partners of Messiah, if we hold our original conviction firm until the end. There you go. Okay, You've got to hold it till the end to receive what? That rest. Let's go on. Verse 15. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, which ones heard and rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt with Moshe? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Was it not to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of lack of trust. Okay? You have to endure to the end. They could not enter the promised land. Okay? Now, and because they didn't stay faithful to the end, could Yeshua do anything about it when he died for all the sins of the world? No, because they did not walk in faith. Okay? Walking in faith is your responsibility. Yeshua does the work, the free gift of salvation, something you can't earn. And you have to put your faith and trust in that. But when you put your faith and trust in Yeshua, you now have a covenant relationship. You have made promises. It's a conditional covenant. Okay? You have responsibilities and Yeshua has responsibilities. He will always keep his end of the bargain up. All right. So now into chapter four. Let us fear then. Okay? He's relating the two. He's not saying, oh, that's something you don't even have to worry about because that was old covenant stuff. That was something before Yeshua. No, he is telling them to uh, warn them about what happened because it can happen to them. He says, let us fear then, though a promise of entering his rest is left open. Some of you would seem to have fallen short. Okay. What do you mean? The entering of his rest is left open, right? You haven't died yet. You haven't entered into eternity yet. So you are still responsible for the covenant. He says, some of you would seem to have fallen short. Some people are not being faithful right now. He's talking about while you are alive, okay? While you are alive. And they're in Yeshua. They have Yeshua as their savior. So let us fear then, though a promise of entering his rest is left open. We haven't entered the rest of Yeshua yet, though we are saved. Some of you would seem to have fallen short, for we also have had good news proclaimed to us just as they did. It's the good news of Yahweh. It's the good news of the Father. That's the good news. And that good news is his faithfulness, his love for his people. And it is what? He did it through his work there in the wilderness. He's doing it in Yeshua now. Was Yeshua there in the wilderness? Yes, he was. I believe he was the angel of the Lord that brought them out. He was the arm of Yahweh, the right hand of Yahweh that came and delivered them. Okay, go ahead and study that out. He was the Malak, the messenger of Yahweh who followed them and was with them 40 years in the desert. Okay. Yeshua did it for them then. He's doing it for us now. But our faith walk is the same. And that would mean the covenant and the commandments are the same. Let's continue. But the word they heard did not help them because they were not unified with those who listened in faith. So the word came forth. They promised to do it, but they did not walk in it. Okay. They were delivered, saved, but they did not remain faithful. It was not combined with faith. Verse three, for we have trusted, for uh, we who have trusted are, are entering into that rest. Okay, we're saved. We've got Yeshua. We're in the process of entering that rest. All right, we don't have it yet, but we're in the process. We have that hope. We have that firm uh, promise by Yeshua. If we remain faithful to the end, we will rest in him. Okay. He is going to be our eternal rest, but we have to walk in faithfulness. It is just as God has said. So in my wrath, I swore they shall never enter my rest. Okay. It's, it's a sheer warning. What is the rest? The rest that Yeshua will give you is eternal life. Okay. They won't enter it. And some of these people here are looking pretty, uh, it's looking pretty grim for them. They're not really walking correctly. So there's this warning going out and they are in Yeshua. They have Yeshua, but they're not walking it out. Uh, some of them aren't, he said. So 
So he says, so in my wrath, I swore they shall not enter my rest, even though his works were finished since the foundation of the world. Okay, his works were finished. He was, the plan was set. Yeshua was going to die for the sins of the world. That was already set, firmly established before the world began. Okay. And even though his works were finished since the foundation of the world, but what? We have to walk our faith walk out. We have to be obedient to the commandments. And the commandments are for our good. Paul says they are holy, righteous, and good. They are a gift given to us so that we can do kingdom living. Okay. We don't make up excuses not to do commandments. We embrace it like King David did. King David loved the commandments. He was thankful because he knew the character of, of Yahweh through the commandments. Through the commandments, we walk in the image of Yahweh. That's how you walk in the image of Yahweh. It's a job duty. We learn how to become like him, and we walk after Yeshua to be conformed to his image so we can be the image bearers. Amen. And so it says here in verse 4, for so somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall never enter my rest. Okay. When Yahweh rested on the seventh day of creation, that was, in a, that was a fellowship time with Adam and Chava. Okay. That was a picture of eternal rest with Yahweh for eternity. He rested from his works, okay? And it says, they shall never enter my rest. Why? Why are they not going to enter that eternal seventh-day rest that is still to come? Because they didn't walk in faith, okay? The Sabbath, Shabbat, is a picture of the eternal rest to come. We're not there yet. We are still working the kingdom right now. The king, we are still spreading the gospel. We are still working in these bodies every day, spreading the love of Yeshua. We need the seventh day to rest. Our bodies need it. It's a day set apart as holy by Yahweh, by his mouth, not man. So man has no right to go around making up, oh, I'm going to do this day. I'm going to do that. Oh, I'm going to rest in Yeshua and not do a Sabbath at all. You're not following the covenant that you made with Yahweh. The covenant and the commandments are there for our benefit to show us kingdom living, and what? To see the character of Yahweh. And when we sin, we do have the blood of Yeshua. Okay, so if we do mess up Shabbat, or if we do mess up a commandment, yes, we can turn to the blood of Yeshua. It can wipe us clean, and we keep going, walking in faith. You don't give up. Okay, you don't give up. Even you can mess up all kinds of Shabbats. You keep going. You keep trying the next time and trying the next time. Amen. Do not have a walk of unfaithfulness. That's what Yahweh is concerned about. That is what happened in the desert. They walked in unfaithfulness continually. So verse 6, so then it remains for some to enter into it. Okay, let's read verse 4 again so we can get this all in context. For somewhere... He has spoken about the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall never enter my rest. So then it remains for some to enter into it. All right, we right here, all of us that are working the kingdom right now, we have not entered into that rest yet. We have to be faithful to the end, and then we will enter. So when it says, so then it remains for some to enter in it, the Shabbat rest still remains for some to enter into it. You won't enter into it until when? Not when you accept Yeshua here and now, no. Because you're still working the kingdom. You enter into his rest after you've died and gone on and you stand before him and he says, enter in thou good and faithful servant. Okay, enter in with me. But you got to remain faithful. You, we're in that desert place right now where we are being tested and we are walking in the commandments and in the covenant, just like they were in the desert. So it says in verse 7, again, God appoints a certain day today, saying through David after so long a time, just as it has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have would not have spoken of another day later. 
on. Okay. Another day later on, Joshua didn't give them that rest when he brought them into the promised land. They still had to keep Shabbat. So there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God. Okay. These are believers in Yeshua. He's not saying you have it in Yeshua. There's no place here saying you can rest in Yeshua. You don't have to keep Shabbat. That's not what it's saying. Nowhere is it saying that. He says in verse 9, so there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God. All the people of God are going to enter into that rest someday. What? When Yeshua returns after the millennial reign, when we uh, do the white throne judgment, we will enter into that eternal rest with Yahweh. Okay? So verse 9, so there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God. We still need to keep Shabbat. We're still under the covenant. For the one who has entered God's rest has also ceased from his own work, just as God did from his. Have you and I stopped doing the kingdom? No. We are still doing the work we are called to do in the kingdom. We have to endure to the end. Okay. For the one who has entered God's rest has also ceased from his own work. Are we still working here on earth? We still got to provide for our families. We still got to do kingdom living. We got to learn how to walk in faith. Then we have not entered that rest yet. And Shabbat is for you, for your body to rest, regenerate, um, rejuvenate your spirit, your, your flesh, everything, your relationships with people, your relationships with your wife and your children. All right? It's a blessing to enter into Shabbat every week because that also is the sign that you are saying there is an eternal rest to come. I celebrate Shabbat right now because there is still one to come that is for all eternity. And yes, through Yeshua, I'm going to get there. Through his blood, I'm going to get there because he's going to forgive me of my sins all along the way as I repent, as I turn, as I walk in him and stay faithful to the covenant. Verse 11. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through the same pattern of disobedience. He is speaking in a synagogue somewhere to believers in Yeshua, telling them to make every effort to enter that rest. He's not saying accept Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, and now you've got that rest. He's saying enter into that eternal rest with Yeshua, which is what you do after you die. Or if he comes back and you're raptured up. Either way, okay, when you meet him in the air or when you meet him after your death, it is appointed for man to die once. All right, in the rapture, you will be changed, you will have a death, you will go from mortal to immortal. Amen. That is that transition period time, and yes, it's after the tribulation period, not a pre trib rapture. So, very important here this is not giving you permission to stop Shabbat. Your eternal rest in Yeshua will come when you meet him face to face. But as of right now, there is no excuse here given for you to, to not do Shabbat. Yeshua kept Shabbat. He showed us how to keep it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19 says, Not one jot or tittle of the Torah will pass away until all is fulfilled. Has all been fulfilled? Absolutely not. He's coming back a second time. Okay, The covenant of Abraham is not complete yet. Israel is not sitting in the land with all their property that they are supposed to have that was given and promised to Abraham. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 1 through 11 has not been fulfilled yet. That's a prophetic word for who? The people of Yahweh. Okay? Israel will be gathered from the four corners of the earth and they will begin to do Torah correctly and Yahweh will circumcise their heart. That's what it says in there. It's a prophecy. And that prophecy of Yahweh circumcising their heart is through the work of Yeshua. Now we know how he's going to do it. He's going to do it through the work of Yeshua. It has not been done yet. Okay, The fall feasts have not been fulfilled yet. Yeshua came and he fulfilled the spring feast and then he left, sat at the right hand of the Father. Now he's coming back again for the fall harvest time, the last of the harvest. That's what those fall feasts are for. So until then, we do the kingdom, we work the kingdom, we keep Shabbat. There is no excuse not to keep Shabbat. It is a blessing. Amen. All right, so now we're going to go to chapter 10. Chapter 10 of Hebrews um, is the next place people will take you. So in chapter 10, 
it says here that the Torah has a shadow of the good things to come, not the form itself of the realities. Absolutely. So the Torah was never given to give you eternal salvation. It is all the shadows. It is the witness of the reality that is to come. Okay. The offering system was a witness of the reality of the work of Yeshua. The, uh, the Sabbath is a shadow of the reality that is to come through the work of Yeshua and e what? eternal rest. But when does that happen? After you die. After you die. So the Torah, the shadow is still for us. It's still here. It points towards the reality of the work of Yeshua. Okay. Has Yeshua cleaned us up? Has his blood made us whole? Absolutely. And now what is our job? Endure to the end. Okay. Not everything has been fulfilled, so it all stands. It all stands. And I know that raises a lot of questions. But when you understand that the Torah is a shadow of the reality, then you understand that we need to do it because that helps us understand the reality. You just don't, oh, I'm going to walk in the reality and you don't even understand what that reality is. The shadow tells you what the reality is. Okay. So in Hebrews chapter 10, the Torah has a shadow of the thing, good things to come, not the form itself of the realities. For this reason, it can never, by means of the same sacrifices they offer consistently year after year, make perfect those who draw near. So all those sacrifices could not perfect you. Only the blood of Yeshua could perfect you. Okay. And so those um, animal offerings were a sign. They were a shadow pointing towards the reality. So they can't perfect you. Okay? They never were created to give you eternal life. There was no commandment in the Torah that say, if you do this, you earn eternal life. No, it was the wedding covenant. You walk in faithfulness because that's what you promised Yahweh to do. I will walk in faithfulness in your commandments. And so this is pointing towards the reality of the work of Yeshua. And none of those offerings could make you perfect. For those who drew near, verse 2, otherwise would they not cease to have offered since the worshipers cleansed once and for all would no longer have consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. What does that mean to take away sins? Okay, Because Yahweh said they were forgiven. If you go back in Baikra, Leviticus Chapters four through six, you will see that when they did the sin offerings and even go to chapter 16 of Leviticus, the day of atonement, they were forgiven, but it couldn't take away the power of sin. Okay. They still, death reigned on the earth. Death reigned in them. Okay. So it couldn't take away the power of sin. It is a constant reminder. And what was it supposed to be reminding us of? How weak we are, how we need um, Yahweh to deliver us. And so Yeshua comes and he delivers us. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, the power of sin. Okay, Everyone still remained in the ground, no matter how many offerings they did. It's kind of like a credit card is how I usually express it. It was the down payment for when Yeshua came, he would pay off your debt. But you had to walk in faith when Yeshua, if he, Yeshua hadn't come yet, you had to walk in faith still, do the offerings, do the animal offerings. But they weren't powerful enough in and of themselves to save you. But it was kind of like you were walking in faith. So it was being credited to your account. Okay. Because you're walking in faith. That's what happened to Abraham. It was credited to him as righteousness. Why? Because he walked in faithfulness. And then just because he walked in faithfulness, that didn't make it good enough for him to get eternal life. No, the work of Yeshua had to pay for everything. Had to pay for everything. Without that, it wouldn't have meant anything. Nobody can earn their salvation, okay? But we still have to walk in faithfulness. All right, let's go on. So when Messiah comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Why? It's, he commanded those sacrifices. So in a sense, yes, he did desire them, but he didn't desire them in the sense of they couldn't, they couldn't perfect them. Okay. It wasn't going to be the final say in the matter. So he wasn't satisfied with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. He did command them to do it in the meantime, right? Till Yeshua came. 
Now they have a greater sacrifice. He says, but a body you prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not delight. Okay, Why did he not delight? It couldn't take away the power of sin. He did delight when they did it in faithfulness, Okay, but the powerness of it, the power of it, he did not delight in it. It wasn't enough. Okay, But we did what we could, right? The Israelites who remained faithful, Daniel, Noah, Moshe, uh, King David, all the, you know, all the prophets, they did what they were supposed to do. Okay. Verse seven. Then I said, behold, I come to do your will, O God. Right. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. What scroll of the book? That's the book of the covenant. The book of the covenant you see in chapter 24 of Shemot. Okay. That's the book of the covenant that was there. Yeshua was the one giving it. Just look in Acts chapter 7. It was the angel. It's like verses 30 through 44. The angel was on the mountain given the commandments to Yahweh. I mean, uh, given the commandments to Moshe. And who is that angel? He is Yeshua, who is also Yahweh. Okay. So he was giving it. It all points to him. It all speaks of him and his work. And so that's why verse 7 says, Then I said, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me, okay, that all those shadows are written about Yeshua. Verse 8, After saying above, sacrifice and whole off, uh, offerings and whole burnt offerings and sin offerings you do not desire, nor do you delight in them, those which are offered according to Torah. Then he said, Behold, I come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. By his will, we have been made holy through the offering of the body of Yeshua, Messiah Yeshua, once and for all. So people will say, see, look at verse 9. I don't have to keep Shabbat. It says that he took away the first to establish the second. But notice, it's not talking about Shabbat. It's talking about the offering system. It's talking about the power of the blood of bulls and goats. He took away that effectiveness and he established the second. The second is the blood of Yeshua. Okay. He took away the what effectiveness of the blood of bulls and goats. It wasn't enough. It couldn't give you eternal life. He wasn't satisfied with that blood. Even though he commanded it, even though when they did it, it was a sweet smelling aroma when they did it with a broken and contrite heart, okay, it was a sweet aroma to Yahweh, but it still wasn't enough. He wasn't satisfied with it. And so he had to establish the second, but this is the offerings. This is the blood. This is not about Shabbat. This is not changing Shabbat, okay? The covenant at Sinai, right, before the book of the covenant, that was before the offering system was even given. And so the offering system is added because of transgressions, okay? And it is added just, what, as a temporary use, right? And it's, it's also to help supply the Levites. The Levites have a covenant with Yahweh. It's their job. It's their inheritance to do this in order for them to receive an inheritance also. So it's not just about you and me. It's not just about the Israelites who gave, but it was about the job of the Levites. They had a job. They had a covenant to do. Okay. But this set of passages here is talking about the effectiveness of the blood. He took away the first to establish the second. The blood of Yeshua is the once and for all sacrifice for our sins. So when we do Torah, okay, when we keep Shabbat, when we keep the feasts, when we love our neighbor as ourselves, when we love Yahweh with all our heart, when we do all that, we eat kosher, we eat those things. When we do that, Right? And if we break those things and we fall short, we have the blood of Yeshua now. We have a better offering. But those are all still commandments. He doesn't take away those commandments. He takes away the effectiveness of what that blood of bulls and goats was. It wasn't powerful enough. And so now we have a more powerful blood, a more powerful offering. And those animal offerings are still going to be done in the millennial reign. They're still going to be done when Yeshua is on the earth. So he's not done with those yet, but the effectiveness of those is now taken away because we have a greater one, the second one. 
So he establishes, he takes away the first to establish the second. It's all about the effectiveness of the blood, right? So it has nothing to do with Shabbat, doesn't give us an excuse to not do Shabbat. Shabbat is about you and I resting, ceasing from our weekly labor, okay? And rejuvenizing, rejuvenizing ourselves in the spirit with one another, our relationships with others. We keep advancing the kingdom, amen? So we can keep advancing the kingdom. So this gives no excuse for not keeping Shabbat. As we go ahead and end this video and end our time together, Jeremiah chapter 33, starting with verse 14, it says, Behold, days are coming as a declaration of Yahweh. Then I will fulfill the good word I spoke concerning the house of Israel and concerning the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a branch of righteousness to spring up for David. Okay, that's Yeshua. That is Yeshua. All right, he's not done with Israel yet. He's not done with the promises to the nations. And if you are in Yeshua, you are grafted into Israel. So he's not done with those. We don't have those full promises yet because he's still got to work that through his covenant. And it's going to come to Israel, to all the world. So we are citizens of Israel now. We are of the commonwealth, Ephesians chapter 2. We are the Israel of God, Galatians 6.16. Okay, Paul still knows, he understands, Romans chapter 11, we are the wild olive branches that have been grafted into the natural olive tree. That is Israel. The root are the covenants. And we have natural branches. Those are ethnic Hebrews that have accepted Yeshua. And we have some broken off because of lack of faith, but they can be grafted back in. So we, wild olive branches, we're Gentiles, we get grafted into Israel. And so here in those days, and at that time, he says, I will cause a righteous branch or a branch of righteousness to spring up for David, and he will execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah, uh, will Judah be saved? And Jerusalem will dwell safely. We're not there yet. It's coming, but we're not there yet. Okay. And this is the name by which he will be called, Yahweh, our righteousness. For thus says Yahweh, for David, there will not be cut off a man sitting on the throne of the house of Israel, nor will the Levitical Kohanim ever lack a man before me to offer burnt offering, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices continually. So they're still going to be done. Okay, Not one jot or tittle of the word is going to fall away until all is fulfilled. So there's still a purpose for them. It's also the promise he gave to the Levites that they would need to do them, that they would, it would be their way of worshiping him, their service. They don't have an inheritance. So we got to be careful. We're not just thinking of us. All right. There's more to the sacrificial system than just all about us. We have the blood of Yeshua. It's eternal. It's once and for all. It's for all of us, but they're still going to be doing animal offerings for other purposes. Okay. It's a shadow pointing to the reality also. So verse 19, and the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, thus says Yahweh, if you can break my covenant, uh, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that the day and the night would not be at their appointed time, only then may my covenant be broken with my servant David, that he would not have a son to reign on his throne and the Levitical Kohanim would not be my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. He's not done with it yet. Okay, Yeshua is going to be here on the earth, and the Levitical priesthood is going to be rolling. Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, that the millennial reign temple is up and running. There's offerings going on. It's not done yet. Okay, the Torah is going to go out to all the earth, Isaiah chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4, Micah chapter, uh, I believe it's 4, chapters 1 through, or verses 1 through 4, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I know it's Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. You can read that. The Torah is going to go out to all the land, his instructions, okay? That's going to include Shabbat. That's going to include Sabbath. So verse 23, the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, have you noticed, have you not noticed what this people have spoken saying, the two families which Yahweh did choose 
he has rejected them, but they despise my people no longer a nation before them. Thus says Yahweh, if I have not made my covenant of day and night firm and the fixed patterns orders ordering the heavens and the earth, only then would I reject the offspring of Jacob and of my servant David, so that I would not take from his offspring rulers over the offspring of Abraham, Yisak, and Yaakov. For I will restore them from their exile and have compassion on them. Okay, he's going to do it. And yes, there's going to be animal offerings. Yeshua is going to be there. We're going to be celebrating all the Sabbaths, all the feasts. If you don't come up during the time of Sukkot, your, your place won't get no rain, it says. Okay, your area will receive no rain if your emissaries, if your people do not come up and celebrate Sukkot. So Sabbath is still commanded today. It is a sin not to keep the Sabbath. And when we keep it wrong, it is a sin. We do have the blood of Yeshua that we can be forgiven of that. But it's time for us to come together and become the body of Messiah that he has called us to be. And that is to walk together. And part of it, part of the covenant is Shabbat. Learn how to do Shabbat. Learn how to do it. Read about it. Engage in it. See how the Gentiles are allowed to do it and get it slowly. Now, if you, um, if you work right now and you just, you just discovered it, you don't know it, of course, nobody's asking you to quit your job because you would put your family in jeopardy. Okay? Pray for Yahweh to open a door that you will be able to celebrate Shabbat. And if you have to work on Shabbat, then celebrate what you can still honor the hours that you're not when you're not working honor shabbat the way it's supposed to be and yahweh will bless you okay ask for forgiveness for not being able to do it correctly you have the blood of yeshua but don't just don't flippantly walk in rebellion now don't just turn from it okay and if you are a firefighter working in the military um hospitals um you know, doing some type of service where you're attending to lives, you're working in a nursing home or something like that, that is permissible to work on Shabbat because life takes precedent over Shabbat. The value of a life, taking care of a life, takes precedent, um, precedence over Shabbat. Okay, so we're definitely not trying to be legalistic here. If you're a Gentile, you are allowed to slowly adapt to it and learn about it and get into it. And again, if you already have an occupation right now and it would jeopardize your family to switch or do something different then you just keep working it your your family's livelihood comes first okay it doesn't come over shabbat but do what you can teach your family about shabbat amen and you will be blessed it's still part of the covenant amen. so i hope this was helpful to you i went a little bit longer than i wanted to or expected to but Definitely have a lot to talk about when it's on the topic of Shabbat. Amen. All right, so we're going to end today with the ironic blessing because it is our desire to have his name, Yahweh, rest on us. Amen. So we're going to say it in Hebrew first and then we'll say it in English. Nothing wrong if you want to say Adonai or Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. I say Yahweh. I believe that is the correct pronunciation. Um, and so that's what I use. Amen. Yevarechacha Yahweh ve Ishmerecha Yaer Yahweh Pa'anav Elacha Veunecha Yesa Yahweh Pa'anav Elacha Veasem Lacha Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine to you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. Amen. Shalom, everyone.